A mammoth comeback. Can large herbivores dominate ecosystem functions? Well, like with so many topics that a lot of people find interesting, Eric has been there first and written some quite interesting things about it. So here's a paper where he's second author in 2010. But we see my... the author's window, Richard, not the ah, slide presentation. The author's window. Or the, the presenter's window, sorry. All oh, right. Okay. God, I've clicked on the wrong one then. Sorry. I'll stop that share and try again. Ah, bother. Oh, everything's gone wrong now. I don't see anything. It might sound silly, but keep calm. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm trying to keep calm here. It's uh, You can still see the author's window, can you? I can see you now. You can see me, right. Right, I can see that. I can't get to the screen where I... It wasn't so terrible. We will still be able to yeah. follow you. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say maybe Richard, you can just go ahead with you know yeah. the view you were having. Okay. Yep, sorry about that. It's having two screens and then clicking the yeah. wrong thing. Resume slideshow here. Right. What can you see now? <laughs> We see you, we only see oh, you. Oh, you just see me now, right. Oh, yeah. God, right. Yeah, that's not good enough. Here we are, I'll try sharing the screen again. And try that one then. Share. That's coming now, that's that's much better now. That's look better, okay. Yeah, that's okay. Good, good. Okay, well, like, and you're now on the second one, the picture of Eric there. Okay, so here is a paper that Eric was co-author of in 2010, Paradigms and Proboscidians in the Southern Great Lakes region. Lovely word, proboscidian. It's something that Eric would have liked, I think, and I guess he wrote that. And in this paper, he said something that I think we've already heard a bit about from Ralph. Mammoths, thought to be primarily grazers, were living in a forested environment with little access to the large quantities of grasses or sedges, the usual diet of grazers. So this is in Illinois, just at the, the end of the last glaciation. And mammoths were showing some, what did Ralph say? Habitat plasticity. And the woolly mammoth did not track tundra as it shifted northwards. And elsewhere in that paper, it's well worth reading, he, he made quite a few comments about the famous mammoth step debate that has been well talked over over many years. But what I want to talk about today is how we might come a little bit further in debates about mammoth step and even wood pasture in, in Britain and look at what's become a very popular topic amongst biologists and paleoecologists. But did mega herbivore extinctions drive vegetation change? And what are the implications of mega herbivore extinctions for management and particularly rewilding and reintroductions of large herbivores? Oh, I have to change my things by hand, something's not going right. Well, many years ago in Copenhagen, I organized a meeting where we invited Franz Vera over. It was at the time when he'd recently published his book and he was a bit critical of pollen analysts at their inability to pay sufficient attention to large animals and grazing activities, particularly earlier in the Holocene. And in this paper, which was with Gina Hannon and Adrian Lister, this is certainly Adrian Lister's comment here, some interglacials in Britain were characterized by a dominance of grazing ungulates, for example, horths and mammoth, but this is likely to have been a result of more open vegetational structure, not its cause. So Adrian Lister then, and I think he still thinks that now, is that large mammals, mega herbivores, don't tend to create vegetation structure. They go to, they show some plasticity in their habitat and they make do with what they've got. And if it's not sufficient, then they, they die out. Well, 
this has really come up recently in a lot of papers, which has stimulated me to come with this talk. Particularly, here's one from the Phil Trans Royal Society, 2020, called Pleistocene Arctic Megafaunal Ecological Engineering as a Natural Climate Solution. So this is quite a big thing. We're very many people concerned about protecting permafrost in Arctic conditions. And a natural climate solution in the Arctic would be nice, holds the potential to be implemented at a scale able to substantially affect the global climate. And what the authors meant here, what they were referring to, were the strong feedbacks between carbon rich permafrost, climate and herbivory suggest a natural climate solution consisting of reversing the current wet moss and shrub dominated tundra and the sparse forest tundra to grassland through a guild of large herbivores. And if that's possible, they actually, those authors say in that paper, it really depends on having large populations of large herbivores and ungulates. And as Adrian Lister and myself wrote many years ago, it would be valuable to have better information about past ungulate population sizes both for the mammoth step debate and the wood pasture debate. And have we got any closer to that? That's what this talk is really going to be about. Here is a paper that many of you will know by Zimov, who has set up the Pleistocene Park in Siberia, where he's rewilded, he's brought back very high densities of large ungulates. And he thinks he's changing the composition of the tundra in a way that is going to be good for protecting permafrost. And in his paper 2012, Quaternary Science Reviews, he cites Guthrie 2006, looking at the time period 15,000 to 9,000 years ago. We're looking now in the Alaska and the Yukon, and here are the pollen day. So we've got Artemisia, Cyperaceae, Graminae with a little bit of Salix, Tundra. And as we go 13,000, 12,000, 11,000, as we lose horse and mammoth from this system, we move into dwarf birch, poplar, and eventually spruce forests forested tundra. And so Zimov uses this as an argument for saying that in the past there is this correlation between an, quite a significant change in vegetation in the tundra and disappearance of at least horse and mammoth and reduction in bison populations. This has been taken up not just by Zimov who was, well he still is, you know, he hasn't published that many papers, actually, and though when you look at his paper, and I'll come back to his paper, I think it doesn't stand up to that close scrutiny, but there have been a lot of rather high-impact papers now about this. Like, here's one, Introduced Herbivores Restore Late Pleistocene Ecological Functions. Jens Christian Svenning is, is part of this. He's in a lot of these papers. And here, Combining Paleodata and Modern Exclosure Experiments to Assess the Impact of Megafauna Extinction on Woody veg Vegetation. This is an example of real hungry science that Ralph was bringing up. Here are biologists from outside looking at paleo questions. And in this PNAS paper, they hypothesized that Pleistocene herbivore assemblages, including large and mega herbivore browsers, would have greatly reduced woody plant abundance and altered species composition and landscape structures, and these are my capitals, if present at sufficient densities. Now, do we know how large these population sizes were in the past? Well, some people have speculated about it, and certainly the plant people, and you know, I was talking, that was really the animal hypothesis I was talking about here in the slide before. The plant hypothesis, of which you know, a few more paleoecologists are represented here, and Adrian Lister is in this group, and Kathy Willis and a few others. This is from two, paper from 2018. Plant controls on Lake Quaternary whole ecosystem structure and function. And the conclusion here is our results do not support the, pre the prevailing notion that the loss of mega herbivore species caused the expansion of woody plants. And they cite Zimoff and Backer papers that I've already mentioned. So we've got a very active debate. And when you look at these Zimoff, Backer, and other people who've written this, they're a little bit skeptical about the ability of pollen data to say anything useful about this debate because of its low resolution. But the real issue, I think, is what were the past herbivore population sizes? Now, how can we get at past herbivore population sizes? Well, for the present day, we can use direct observation. And I'll show you some data about this in a second. We've heard of today already about Mary Jose and Bearer's pollen indicators that sometimes are giving some an idea of whether grazing pressure is increasing or decreasing and, and when it's particularly high. We've got dated bones. And I shall come back to that because that Zimov has used that to 
you know, very quantitative way to work out numbers of animals in the landscape. In Sweden and probably some other countries for the historic period, but that goes back to about the 1300s, 1400s in Sweden in some places, we've got very good taxation records about domestic animals particularly. We've heard already today, actually this morning, for Huang from China, I really liked his talk about NPPs and sporum moriella and fungal, fungal spores. There are some lipid biomarkers that are relevant. But one area that's been slightly neglected, I think, and it's a slightly controversial area, but it's one I want to take up today, is the ancient DNA record, because you will, oh, I'll show you some ancient DNA data in a second, where they often produce something called effective population size, which is very much a genetic term. So here's some taxation data from Sweden. This is produced by Dahlström, her PhD thesis 2006. It hasn't really got the attention it deserves, I think, but what it shows for southern Sweden, this is a province of 13,000 hectare area in Småland, southeast Sweden. But we had a great peak in domestic animals in this 13,000 hectare area. We had over 5,000 domestic animals around about 1840, 1850, and then a big crash down to the present day. Certainly the, the highest number of animals, and these were made up of goats, cat, you know, the goat, goats, cattle, and sheep. Rather a good source of data because we've got pollen data covering those sorts of periods as well. And here is a pollen diagram produced by Leif Björkman from Cullen. And this is, if we're looking at about the period 1850 or so, those data were from Smallland, the grazing data, but Leif says that there was certainly massive grazing pressure in the 1800s. And we can see increases in grasses and herbs. We see a Kaluna period here. We, and then when grazing relaxes, we see a succession involving juniper and, and willow and trees coming back with trees at the bottom. So there's no doubt when there's quite heavy grazing pressure and we can actually estimate how many animals there were involved in that, we, we see a record of it, a clear record of it in, in at least the Swedish pollen record. Here's this other type of evidence I was talking about. This is a paper by Lorentzen in Nature. It's a few years ago now, but there have been plenty more of these skyline plots produced then. And here we've got, it's quite hard to see here, but this is log NE times the generation time. So this is evidence for bison here. Well, let's actually look at the reindeer, because the reindeer I'm going to talk a bit about. Reindeer here. So this is the log of the effective population size, and the log is 6.5, so that means it's you know, 6 million reindeer in an area that she also produces in her paper. You can, she's done some species distribution modeling and come up with the potential range area of reindeer. And this, these are records going back from zero to 50,000 years ago. So it's a question that I've I remember the first time I was at an ancient DNA talk and I heard someone talk about effective population size. I said, well, what does that mean in relation to what we might call the census population size, the real numbers of animals? And the answer is there is a relationship between the two. NE is effective population size. N is census population size. And there's this nasty, well, for some people, a nice looking equation. For me, a quite nasty equation. But I have done a little bit of a back of an envelope job, which is what this talk is about. We need to know the generation time of the organism you're looking at. And we, we know that pretty well for elephants. And so we think mammoths might have been about the same. And we certainly know it for reindeer. And those are the only two I'm going to show at the moment. We need to know the sex ratio, how many, what's, what's the male to females in the breeding groups? How big is a family? How, and it's often, you know, how big is your harem? And for elephants, well, in the Jungle Book, it's you know, two to three wives or something. And here's a bunch of elephants standing around. It, in elephants, it seems it's about three or four, probably the same for mammoths. We need to know the adult lifespan. We've got that for elephants. It's a bit more tricky to come up with variance in reproductive success, but you can, you can do it on the back of an envelope. And I haven't done it more than that yet. I'm sort of thinking of getting together with a mathematician and doing this a little more accurately. Oh, goodness, that says I've done 15 minutes, right? And I've had, I'm getting near the end. Okay, herbivore mass per unit area at the present day. This is some really big data based on many, many sites from Europe at the present day. Herbivores are presented as kilograms per square kilometer. And in Africa, where there are lots of large herbivores still left, we get the largest value, 6,500 kilograms per square kilometer. How does this compare with the past? And this is the work I've actually done for this talk. I was talking about small lump, here's Dahlstrom's data. 
In her day, for in Smallland, we had 9,500 domestic animals, so it doesn't include deer and things, kilograms per square kilometer in the 1800s. Gina Hannan, Chiara Molinari, and myself have just made a calculation for Hallands Vedrut, a small island off southwest Sweden, where in the 1800s we had 20,200 kilograms per square kilometer, much, much higher than anything we see in the world today. And these we saw represented in the pollen, in the pollen record. Pleistocene Park, which is where Zimov has stocked it to this level, 10,500. But Zimov, so that, that's what he has there today, and it's having quite an impact on vegetation because it's, it's up in areas that have impact on, on vegetation, but far higher than grazing values in Africa today. But Zimov looks back into the past and he's got this method with bones. You'll have to look at his paper because I'm running out, I'm out of time. He makes a calculation that reindeer alone were in the past, and he's talking about 15 to 20,000 years ago, was about 1,500 kilograms per square kilometer of reindeer. And a mammoth, he says, 2,500. Now I've made that, that same calculations using Lorentzen's data and effective population size, census population size, orders of magnitude less, particularly for mammoth. Now they, I think this is really important to follow this through. I, I, my geneticist colleague said, this is really dangerous trying to, to calculate the census population from effective population size, but, but it's been done for Neanderthal man, man, it's been done for sharks, it's been done for domestic animals in Estonia, curious enough, they're the only papers I can find so far. Richard, while this is exciting, yeah. could you come okay. to the end? Yeah, we are at the end. The conclusions, large herbivores have been more diverse in the past. Large herbivores can influence vegetation composition at high population densities. Pollen data do record intense herbivore pressure associated with domestic animals, at least in Sweden, because many people have said they don't, they, they eat all the flowers or something. And the mammoth step animal hypothesis may be based on debatable estimates of past herbivore densities. That's the end.